Well, Galena, I'm going to go ahead and just do a little orientation. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Ellen Teeter with the Florida State Oriental Medical Association. I'm the executive director. And tonight we have Galena Rufner, the president, Lauren Schaefer, who is holder, who is the uh, on the insurance committee and also an insurance biller, and David Bibby, and they have information to share. And then we will open it up for questions later. We are being recorded, so just be aware. Um, I'm sure you all have been on Zoom before, but if not, there is a control bar. Um, we will unmute you when we get ready to answer, ask questions. Make sure you minimize background noise. Um, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat, and I will uh, either wait till later in the program or interrupt if it seems like it needs to be ans answered right then. So I'm going to let uh, Galena go ahead and start. And welcome to everyone. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. And thank you for uh, participating in our uh, little town hall. Um, as of Asoma, we are here to protect and guide the profession by as much as we can. That's our the most important purpose. Therefore, many of members and non-members alike contact us with all different sorts of questions. Some of them we try to resolve and answer based on our knowledge. Some uh, we outsource and contact professionals, such as Lori Schaffer, who is our business member and professional insurance biller. We have our legislative team uh, with our medical um, questions attorney, with our uh, really true legislative campaign uh, members. And lately, we are receiving a lot of questions regarding insurance. Um, they primarily fall in three um, most important uh, domains right now. First on the list is refusal to pay evaluation and management codes. Many of the insurances um, one probably of the most on the forefront uh, uh, being Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. Another really important uh, uh, concern is high rate of claim, den claim denials. People are wondering why. And the third concern which we hear about is overpayment collection by insurance companies. And it has been quite a few of those as well. So we as um, FASOMA try to investigate why, what's happening, what remediation we as a profession and a professional association can move forward. Like for example, I will give for you a brief descriptions which are uh, justifications which our uh, FASOMA members receive from insurance companies. For example, one of them, because of the Florida statute 381.026 says that primary care provider means a healthcare provider license under chapter 458, 459, or 464. That chapter 457.102 doesn't matter and that either way, the verbage acupuncture means a form of primary health care is not the same language as primary care providers. They will not be recognizing us as uh, PCPs and as such are denying any evaluation and management codes we build. The another one, evaluation and management is not within the scope of practice of acupuncturists. And just two of the examples, whichever justifications are. So uh, we did a little bit of investigation. What is legal background for them to say that, what they said, and how we can defend ourselves? So from CMS guidelines, Medicare, Medicaid, and other third-party payers accept evaluation and management codes on claims that physicians and other qualified healthcare professionals 
submit to request reimbursement for their professional services. A qualified healthcare professional, because that's an importance of uh, uh, definition is, is an individual who is qualified by education, training, licensure and regulation than applicable and facility privilege than applicable who performs a professional service within his or her scope of practice and independently reports that professional service. This is a CPT guideline. This is AMA. Evaluation and management code descriptors and rules often refer to physicians and other health uh, uh, and other qualified healthcare providers. This may include advanced practice nurses, APNs, and physician assistants. Clinical staff members do not fall in this category. So let's just look at definition. What is clinical staff member is? Is a person who works under the supervision of a physician or other qualified healthcare professional and who is allowed by law, regulation, and facility policy to perform or assist in the performance of specific professional services, but does not individually report that professional service. Again, it's a CPT guidelines. Looking at all that, I would say that because we are independently performing and reporting services, we don't need a physician oversight by Florida law. We shall qualify as qualified healthcare professionals. Therefore, we shall be reimbursed for, for evaluation and management services. So another um, refusal is that evaluation and management services are not included in our scope of practice. So that's a FASOMA is really excelling in working for you guys. And with all of your help, as volunteering for FASOMA, as uh, bringing non-members to be a FASOMA members, we can gather a necessary amount of money to modernize Florida Acupuncture Practice Act to clearly include evaluation and management codes. Right now, it's a little ambiguous in our current language. It's why for us, that update, which uh, David Bieber graciously is leading with his immense expertise, we can do that. So we create a legal ground. Absolutely no problem said. So another thing which uh, um, we as uh, um, a professional association, with your help, can do we can hire an attorney to defend the profession. Why? Because we did consult attorney. It's enough money in our budget to consult attorney. But keep in mind, it's not enough to hire an attorney to lead a case. That's we even have a hard time to estimate what going to be costing because we first need to modernize Florida practice law. And only after that, we might be uh, making a next step. But that's a, your participation is absolutely a prime importance. If you don't participate, if we don't unite, we, we will not progress anywhere because it's outrageously expensive endeavor to hire an attorney on your own. We can do it together. That's in its cost, not that much per each person. But our attorney, what he said, the sections 381.026 Florida statutes makes very clear that those definitions only apply uh, to uh, sections of uh, 381.026 and uh, 381.026H. So this sounds like a bad faith attempt by Blue Cross Blue Shield to avoid its payment responsibilities. So we do have a legal ground to defend ourselves and our ability to bill for evaluation and management codes, at least from the third party insurance companies. It may be not the case uh, with uh, uh, Medicare, but it's definitely a case with third party. So 
another task uh, which we can do, we also can negotiate with insurance companies. And it applies not only to evaluation and management, it also applies to rates and so forth. So David Beebe uh, did an immense work and uh, at the advice of our um, healthcare attorney, contacted uh, uh, the professional company which negotiates with insurance companies on behalf of professions. David, can you tell us a little bit more about outcomes of that contact? Thank you, Galena. Um, yes. And so, you know, I approached our, a group of attorneys that represent the EPSOMA and the profession here in Florida. And I asked them, I said, you know, how is it that, uh, you know, other professions have routine conversations about things like you touched on, Galena, uh, reimbursement rates, but also things like the scope of coverage for different types of conditions. And my question to them was, you know, this line of communication with insurance companies seems to be really tightly protected. You know, you can't just pick up a phone and call Blue Cross and say, I want to talk to somebody about um, these questions. And and after, you know, having a really clear understanding of what we were looking for, they the law firm made a couple of recommendations, but I spent some time speaking to an attorney who's based actually out of South Carolina, but they work on behalf of um, professions like ours. And her advice is that, you know, there is a period of time throughout the year, and it's usually about a six-month period, where... The conversation, as much as we think that the emphasis would be like coordinating with the medical directors, trying to better understand medical necessity and going through all of the weeds with how care is delivered, her 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 professional advice on this was that that's not really the right door to be knocking on. She said most of the questions regarding things like reimbursement, uh, eligibility for evaluation and management, the nature of the relationship between the provider and the beneficiary for insurance companies is handled actually through their contract uh, with with the insurance company. So when you're credentialing with an insurance company, there's a coding and a process that's that's determined from inside the insurance company based on the type of contract that you have as a as a in network or provider type for services that they cover for their beneficiaries as to what you're eligible to provide. It's done there during co in contracting and not necessarily done through the medical director and medical necessity evaluation and all of this. And so it's a bit like your contract is pre-programmed to allow you, um, you know, it, it sort of determines how you fit into the benefits model and treatment access for the beneficiary. And so there's a period of time that opens. She said it's usually about a six month window where they have an opportunity to, to meet with the contract coordinators and provide a presentation and saying, look, we want to make some material changes to your in the network um, eligibility for acupuncturists. These are the things that we're asking for and these are the reasons why. And she was very clear that all of this has got to be data driven. It's a really... The conversation with the insurance companies has got nothing to do with training, nothing to do with qualifications, nothing to do necessarily even with, um, you know, our best instincts on how we can save money. They said, she said, all they're interested in is data. How is, what is the utilization rate? What is the outcome? And their area of expertise is helping us as a profession coordinate that data in such a way that the insurance companies are able to digest it and take it and use it in a, in a usable way. And she said, there's a little bit of a back and forth where you may meet with them and then you're going to work on, they're going to send you to, back to answer some questions that are part of your presentation, need clarification. You come back, provide those answers. You're going to get a new set of answers. And it's, they're not necessarily negotiating the numbers of all this, but it's about getting our profession to properly uh, provide them with all of the data they need to make a decision going forward. 
And she said, you know, you know, you may not get 100% of what you're asking for, but it's a building a relationship and it's about getting a toehold in that discussion. And then in next year, you know, there's the season to this. You'll be back at the table with them again to either um, expand what's available. Maybe it's a question of something like they're going to cover chronic low back pain, which mirrors the requirements for Medicare, but that's their only um, condition that they're going to recognize. But we have our, they don't need to follow the Medicare guideline. They can, they have, they have to do it as a minimum standard, but typically we can come back and say, look, we want to talk to you about cervical pain. Here's the data on that. We want to talk to you about shoulder. We want to talk to you about internal disorders. We want to talk to you about um, other conditions that are expensive to treat. And our job is to make the math work for the insurance company. But this is done through a consulting company. It's not something that, you know, an acupuncturist is, you know, even our association, we've got a lot of dedicated, smart people that work tirelessly on projects, but this is a skill set um, that requires professional consul you know, consultants to handle for us. And so they're prepared to do that, um, you know, but it's, it's a lot of hours for them. It's a, they're going to be educating and working with us to get the data that they need. Then they have to turn around and make the presentations to the insurance companies. And she said, typically, you know, Blue Cross is a good place to start because, you know, once you, you know, develop a policy and have some changes instituted with a company like Blue Cross or any of the big companies, she said the others are much easier. You know, they're likely to follow their lead with Blue Cross without us even really having to do much more than ask. You don't have to continually climb that mountain, but the mountain does have to be climbed. And once you develop that relationship, it doesn't make sense to just turn and walk away. You're going to come back every year and say, we want, you know, to either increase the reimbursement. We want to change the, the plan of care model that you're using. We want to, you know, streamline the medical necessity review process. There are other things that we want to continue to do to improve the relationship between us as a profession, individual providers, and the insurance company. Uh, the math on this is what you'd expect from, you know, hiring a law firm who probably has a team of, you know, four to six people that are working, uh, you know, putting in a lot of hours. But the initial budget for that was something in the range of between 125 and 150,000 for a six month project. But at the end of the project, you'll have an answer from the insurance company as to, in terms of, you know, how this profession is going to move forward. And if there's a rationale why we failed and they're not going to make the changes that we want at least we have answers and then you have to work on the answers and continue to perfect your argument in order to you know make the case that we need to make and so you think about the math um, it's the same amount of money that we used uh, when we were defending dry needling with the physical therapy uh, profession and that you know was a, a full-on you know a year or 18 months uh, legal process and so there's probably some room to negotiate the math on that. And ultimately we'll come up with, with a number, but the profession, our profession, you know, tends to have a, you know, a sticker shock when we hear numbers like 80, 90, a hundred thousand, but this is the reality of trying to move a tectonic plate. You know, the insurance company has its own processes, internal and external. It likes its decision-making processes just the way they are. And we want to, you know, impact and influence that to our benefit. It's going to require a professional presentation, team work hours, and a major investment from from the profession here in Florida to make that happen. But that that's the that is the road forward. And if we choose to take that road, we'll learn a lot. Um, we you know we'll probably like we will see changes that we've been looking for, but we'll realize that it's part of a an ongoing process and a continuing negotiation. And if we don't take that road, um, then, you know, we're going to be on the outside looking in, wondering, you know, why things are getting worse instead of better for us um, as a profession. When we know in our hearts that we have safe, effective care that saves money when it's utilized properly, it creates better outcomes that are safer for patients. You know, all of the things that we know to be true about our medicine should be reason enough for the insurance companies to to consider more acupuncture instead of less, but that's just not the way that this system is designed. It's 
It's not a, you know, bumping into somebody and having a conversation. This is a full-on professional effort that requires um, professional input from people who are very ex experienced about developing those relations. Thank you, Galena. Thank you, David, very much. So, and how David said, it is definitely um, a sticker price shock. Um, I can give for you a financial da data. For for example, last year, the total dues paid by all members of the FASOMA per year were $130,000. So, and that's total money. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, out of this money comes all of our expenses, uh, uh, the legal defense expenses, the everything. This year, we are working a little bit more trying to uh, raise funds for our legal defense to modernize practice act. We obviously cannot swing two very large, very costly projects whatsoever th there is just not enough money so we do need a participation of the profession um the the real life is we have what about 14 percent participation from all licensed acupuncturists and every single one of us loses horrendous amount of money every day by billing insurance and not getting paid for, for services if we all would become a members of the FASOMA and look at the appropriate tier. Next year, we are trying to um, show the reality picture for our profession. We will have a different tier membership, just a basic tier, tier with legislative support if you want to donate on a regular basis because we must to update our practice law, otherwise we, we will not move anywhere and the tier to uh, donate money, uh, or it's actually even not donation. I would say that it's a crowdfunding for the effort to negotiate with insurance companies. On, on our own, just one person at the time, we cannot fight the machine, but together we can make a difference. We need your participation, guys. We need to negotiate the rates, we need to get paid on much broader spectrum of the conditions and much, uh, uh, you know, more polite rates. So we need your participation. That is point blank. That's where it comes. So where, what we can do, because you heard David, even if we eventually hire uh, the professional, we need data. So what data we need? We need standards of acupuncture practice. Just last weekend, I was in Washington DC participating in the job analysis survey for NCCOM. And was talking with Mina Larson, CEO of NCCOM, was talking with Thomas Co, uh, president of Council of Colleges, and uh, uh, probably standards of the profession will be coming, will be coming real soon because we as a profession need to write them. It's not Ash or Optum or any other uh, insurance company or third party intermediary responsibility to write for us standards of acupuncture practice. It's our responsibility. They are in the works, they should be coming. So also, before we really start a big negotiation, one of the things which is interim, we can explore and see, can we any possible to achieve? And David, that's uh, your input will be very, very important in any one of you who ever dealt with any insurance companies. We can follow the following states like Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Maryland. They have an acupuncture as an essential healthcare benefit on their CMS guidelines. So we can con uh, directly contact CMS and get our designation of essential healthcare benefit. And we do have enough data and we do have a precedent for that. That's something which we can take on as a FASOMA. 
Within the FASOMA, we have few different committees. And right now, uh, you are at meeting organized by our insurance committee. Please, 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 we need your help. Please volunteer on the FASOMA website. In the tab about, you will find membership. Please volunteer. You actually will find committees, committee staff. Please volunteer. We need your expertise. We need your knowledge. We need to step forward because there is just very limited amount what uh, uh, Kim, Lauren, and I can do. And yes, I'm a president. I have many other tasks. So Lauren can be on consulting position, but not really prepared to do the work. So Kim by herself cannot take just that humongous task. We need your help. So that's uh, um, one of the uh, pathways which we can do. And the third one, we can advocate for legislative mandate for acupuncture coverage for all of the insurance companies. Some states have been uh, able to achieve it. I am not sure is it really achievable at this time in Florida, but that's something which, you know, it's all about whom do you know? That's also one of the options um, for um, our endeavors. So now, claim, claim denials and most common reasons why claims is denied. Unfortunately, this is a deficiency on the part of the profession. Very commonly, we insufficiently educated on uh, the subject, uh, uh, how to support the medical necessity. That is one of the most important uh, uh, things with that. And medical necessity uh, includes not only documenting how well patient uh, improved, but also knowing upfront what conditions actually patient policy and that patient specific policy will pay for. Because you can document whatever you want, but if you bill in for the condition which insurance company doesn't pay for, at this stage, it's useless. But in the future, we can negotiate and we can open more of that. But here I just to, to provide, try to provide for you points. Incorrect CPT codes, incorrect ICD codes, incorrect modifiers, unreasonable amount of CPT codes, and insufficient documentation and lack of support of medical necessity. So one of the problems which we have as a profession, we are trying to be jack of all trades and master of none. No physician in sober mind sits on the phone and calls insurance companies to verify benefits. No physician in sober mind fills a HICFA form, even if there is a and electronic software and so forth. It's time for us as a profession to start acting as other professions do. Outsource to the third party professional insurance biller because they keep an update. If you didn't know that CPT codes are updated every October and some of the codes may be not valid any longer and you will waste enormous amount of time which you could see the patient and make money and you will face a numerous denials just because that particular CPT code is not active any longer and it got changed last year. That is one of the simplest examples or just incorrect modifier and so forth. Um, as a FASOMA, uh, we provide an opportunity for reputable companies to become our business member. Like, for example, uh, Lauren Schaffer Billing is our business uh, member. We have um, one or two other ones which are business members, and that's something which you can find uh, uh, on the FASOMA website. So. This is just a proper professional behavior, which again will save you money. And um, I can tell you from my own personal experience, my insurance biller not only made me a lot of money guiding my billing, 
but actually then I needed to move from St. Peter that I practiced previously to uh, Cologne, Ohio. He actually even helped me to uh, sell my business. So, you know, some of those things. It's very important for us to be a team player. All right. So, and that there is a website uh, specifically on the FASOMA. I just would provide for you some guidance. We also have uh, uh, for you an opportunity to ask questions. Like, for example, we have uh, um, insurance forum. You don't have to suffer alone. Then we gather the data, then we connect together. We are stronger. Please utilize our insurance forum. So, um, and again, a little bit more uh, emphasizing the deficiencies which must be resolved. Um, as a profession, we must produce written practice standards. I gave for you an example for PTs, a simple stand, uh, standard of practice, which actually includes evaluation and management yeah? and how it should be. That is a ground, even if we employ professionals to negotiate on our behalf, they will need some hardcore support. And that is one of those. Improve uh, uh, practitioner education in the healthcare documentation. That also area is not done correctly in our profession. And actually one of the questions for you, which I would like for you to answer in our Q and A section, how many of you know what changed in 2021 CMS guidelines in regards of evaluation and management codes? So that is a question for the future. So another goal which we need to have, we need to achieve at least 90% of PASOMA membership among Florida licensed acupuncturists. That's then we don't have to wait a year or two or three until we gather the money to hire the professional. We can hire the professional even if we have 50% uh, participation from a Florida licensed acupuncturist because this is money out of your pocket which can be in. And it's just because low rate participation and we are acting from poverty position and I feel, you know, like beggar on the streets sometimes. So, and uh, uh, the last point which uh, we would like to ask you to do, volunteer to work on the FASOMA committees. So, now let us take a look at uh, um, recouping of reimbursement uh, by insurance companies. That seems to be another question which we hear frequently. Um, one of uh, our practitioners said that her insurance company is just taking money out of, your, of her account four years later than the service was administered. So we all need to know the law. Um, And uh, um, here is uh, the Florida statute, specifically from chapter 627, insurance rates and contracts. Um, payment of acupuncture benefits to certified acupuncturist, any policy of individualized health insurance that provides coverage for acupuncture shall cover the service of acupuncture certified pursuant to chapter 457 under the same conditions that apply to services of a licensed physician. So that is one of the questions of the statement to our benefits. But I want to point out for you, if we are want to be getting paid as the physician, we need to document and serve as a physician. And we obviously do not document as a physician. I see a lot of notes and that is a problem. So as a FASOMA, we provide for you some uh, education resources and we will have more of them. Medicaid and Medicare services uh, uh, 
by David Beebe. He gives for you a really great overview. Lauren in the past taught insurance billing uh, 101 uh, webinar. Please make sure that you take those classes. Here are some classes which I teach uh, and they are available recorded on my website specific to uh, documentation. We also have up incoming MEC or class on the documentation. So there is a lot of the resources. Then you want to consult and actually have on your professional teams, um, third party insurance biller, here's the contact information uh, for uh, Lauren. Um, well, one more I want to return. and show for you our last conversation on uh, um, our uh, forum. Uh, you do need to log in to see the forum. So and you uh, need to be a member. We yes, have some non-members here, here, Delina. So yes, you do need to uh, be a member to log in and utilize uh, the benefits. But then you go to insurance forum, you just will click on uh, the page and that is one of the ways how to communicate with the profession uh, the most uh, um, efficient way for everybody could access. Like for example, there was a question how back insurance companies may collect overpayment. I researched the Florida uh, law and answer it, which exactly is in chapter 627, that all claims for overpayment must be submitted to a provider within 30 months after the health insurance payment of the claim. A provider must pay, deny, or contest the health insurance claim for overpayment within 40 days after receipt of the claim. All contested claims for overpayment might be best paid or denied within 120 days of receipt of the claim, and so forth. So there is quite a bit of the different things. So looking at that law, that insurance company, which just draws money out of practitioner account, doesn't act right, doesn't act legally. He is our defense. But how I said, it's very expensive to hire a health attorney on your own to defend you using legislator. You can try to do argument yourself, but if you have problems and many of you do have that problems and just let their hands hang, we can do crowdfunding and hire an attorney to defend. But for that, we need your participation and we need that crowd funding to hire an attorney. So that's few things uh, what I wanted to uh, tell you today. And- Galena, can, can I- yes. Yeah, I just want to add a quick thought if I might, Galena. That was an excellent presentation and reminder of some of the rules and regulations that insurance companies have to play by. But one of the things that stands out in my mind after many years of being involved with the state association is that we have a tremendous opportunity. One of the most incredible assets that we have here in Florida is a large and robust profession. With more than 2,500 practitioners here in Florida, we should have a powerhouse of you know, communication and direction for this profession. There is no reason, no rational reason in my mind that we languish with some of these issues. Um, the only reason why we do is because we have a low participation from the whole of the profession. And, you know, everybody that's listening tonight, if you have colleagues and friends that you meet with and discuss um, issues regarding the profession and they're not members or they're considering being uh, members, this is why it's so important that we circle our wagons with, you know, 2,000 practitioners, you know, contributing dues, 
we wouldn't be talking. I mean, there's re other reasons to talk about crowdfunding. At this point, we would have the resources to have solved some of these problems years ago. The challenge with it is as the profession is moving forward, the demand for access and use of acupuncture in acupuncture is growing. But our voice is getting quieter and quieter and quieter. And the challenge is that other people, like Galena was just saying, you know, the American Specialty Health Network or Optum is making clinical and professional decisions about how acupuncture services are delivered um, because the profession is unable to coalesce in such a way that we own and control the narrative. The most important thing for anybody listening tonight in order to solve this and some other issues that really present some headwinds for growth of our profession is the lack of cohesion and people just willing to say, hey, you know what? Here's my dues. I'm a standing member of my professional association because I'm a professional practitioner. You know, I don't know how many, you know, physical therapists and chiropractors and other professionals, you know, worry about whether or not they should or shouldn't join the professional association. They do it because they know that somebody has to have a controlling voice for moving the profession forward, protecting and promoting the interests of the profession, not only so that we can continue to provide high quality care to our patients, but so that we can, um, you know, navigate a professional career uh, in a way that doesn't lose ground. We need to be able to apply all of our skills and training to solve our patients' problems and issues and improve their outcomes. Uh, but we can't do it as a fractured group. And it's the same message I've been hearing and saying and repeating for 10 years, but it's becoming more and more critical now than it was, I would say, in the early 2000s. Because as the profession is emerging and other people want to pick up the needle and provide acupuncture services, our voice is getting crowded out, and so are the interests of acupuncturists. Um, but it's it's the greatest opportunity we have in Florida is that we don't need to go out and license two thousand acupuncturists; they're already here. You know, a state like Maryland has got one hundred and eighty six acupuncturists. You know, imagine if we only had two hundred acupuncturists in Florida. You know, th we would have a serious like in Ohio. We would lose right. our practice of herbs or something else. Precisely. With with more than 2,000 people licensed here, this should be a slam dunk. And, you know, getting the attention of legislators, getting the attention of regulators, getting the attention of the insurance commissioner, getting the attention of CMS, these should be easy things. We should have the resources to move the profession forward. And so to me, I always think that the greatest opportunity is just looking around the room at our colleagues, the people we went to school with, the people we practice, you know, with and nearby. And, you know, reaching out to them and saying, look, you know, we have some serious headwinds that are, are making it a challenge for the profession to continue to grow and to thrive. And so not only is that not good for us as professionals, but it's not good for our patients. It's not good for Floridians. It's not good for the world. More acupuncture is much better than less. And so our role, while we have the opportunity, is to sort of expand the footprint of acupuncture. And we need to do it together. Okay. Thank you, Galena. Thank you, David. Alrighty. So um, now uh, let us uh, start with Q and A se session, and uh, you are very welcome to ask uh, Lauren uh, questions. You know, maybe not that specific to your practice, but uh, more pertaining to what is uh, going on in the insurance field. Dr. Lee, I'm going to uh, unmute you, or you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Looks like we had people leave. So, nope. Okay. If we don't uh, have any questions. Um, we don't have any questions. The last question, which I would uh, like to ask Lauren, would you like to add anything and what you see in your practice? Because in mostly what we hear about denials and troubles for those practitioners who try to build on their own, 
without employing the uh, professional insurance biller. What is happening in your practice? What do you see? Um, just to kind of piggyback off of what uh, David said, you know, we we are seeing the reduction in the number of needles and units that you're able to bill. We've seen the reduction in fees that are, you know, reimbursement rates. Um, and the reduction in restrictions of the evaluation and management codes. So kind of as a whole, the general trend over the course of the last five years is less and less and less and less. And, you know, there are so few people to advocate for acupuncturists and other professions that are experiencing the same thing. Um, you know, just to kind of add in the, the importance that there is nobody else to speak for you guys, um, you know, and, and we're here as consultants to help and educate and guide along the way. Um, you know, when it comes to working within the box that the insurance company is setting, um, you know, we can certainly assist as far as reviewing information and saying, you know, okay, you're looking to bill this patient for infertility or fertility treatments um, that would be deemed experimental and investigational. Are you treating the patient for any of these according to you know what Cigna allows or Aetna allows or one of the other insurance companies? And then I think along those same lines, the importance of verifying your benefits ahead of time so that you're asking those questions, making sure you know, acupuncture is covered, but can it be performed by a licensed acupuncturist? Um, seems like a silly question, but it's a very important question. Um, finding out if acupuncture is only covered in lieu of anesthesia. That's another one that we run into a lot that, you know, you verify the benefits, we find out that they have, the patient has coverage, but it's only in lieu of anesthesia. So they don't actually have coverage. Um, and then when you throw in all the specifics in the the Medicare replacement plans and things like that, things just kind of get a little squirrely. So verifying benefits and asking all of the appropriate questions out front will put you in the best position to get paid on the back end. And also give you a leg to stand on in the event that you have to file an appeal. You know, the insurance companies will give you misinformation um, telling you that there's coverage when there isn't or, you know, things like that. And you bill, you don't get paid. They say it's not within, you know, the patient doesn't have that type of coverage. So now we have to argue, we, you know, and having that benefit verification that, you know, the representative gave you this information, you wouldn't have treated the patient as an insurance patient, um, you know, kind of gives you, like I said, a leg to stand on when, if you have to file an appeal. Thank you, Lauren, very much. And probably the last thing which I would like to say to the best of my knowledge, and please correct me if it's not true, uh, dry needling is not insurance covered CPT codes yet. But the moment insurance companies will start paying for dry needling, and they will because they already created CPT codes. And other professions have much stronger lobby than we do. The moment they cover dry needling, we're dead as a profession. So we need to gather our act together and advocate and lobby for us and negotiate the rate with insurance. So we need your participation, guys. We need your help. Please contact the FASOMA, how you can help and join the FASOMA. Thank you so much. And I guess we will uh, finish our presentation at that note.